So Father Rehill, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm looking forward to uh, talking with you about uh, spiritual warfare. Uh, you know, you, you know a little bit about that, being both the exorcist for the Diocese of Nashville, as well as the host of the Battle Ready uh, podcast. And uh, I've been enjoying those episodes. Just listen to the one that you did uh, just last month about the uh, the protest in LA with the uh, with the the drag nuns and and mm -hmm. all of that. So um, really looking forward to unpacking with you uh, the state of spiritual warfare. So thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me, Paul. All right. So uh, kind of to start us off, uh, well, actually, uh, you know, uh, my my P's and Q's. Would you mind starting us off with a prayer? Not at all. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Mm -hmm. Come, Holy Spirit, come by means of the powerful intercession of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, thy well-beloved spouse. Come with your gifts of wisdom, knowledge, understanding, and perfect deference to your perfect will, that all would be for the glory of God our Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Saints Peter and Paul. Pray for us. Pray for us. us. All right. Well, thank you so much. Let me ask you just to, to kind of get us started. Um, would you say, or how would you say the state of the spiritual battle has changed in the last 10 years? Because it seems like things have kind of accelerated. Um, okay. At least, or maybe I'm more attuned to it now than I've ever been in my life, but it just seems like we're living in some really weird times. And so, you're an exorcist. You deal with the supernatural all the time. Can you tell us, I mean, how has things changed? Uh, well, it's become very bad. I would say maybe the worst in history um, for several reasons, you know, not the smallest of which being COVID closing all the churches. That was absolutely the worst possible thing we could have done um, in terms of uh, advancing the kingdom of God, right? So we're taking away the sacraments from the people. Um, people are stuck home with idle time on their hands. The human beings, when they're idle, tend to do bad things. And then you just compound it with anxiety, fear, and stress. Mm -hmm. And those are also factors that cause people to do things they normally wouldn't do. Um, so that was its whole, a whole mess all there. But the other thing is the social media that's fairly, you know, new to humanity in terms of the timeline of history of people. This is a new way to compound sin exponentially through the Internet, through social media. Um, and it's not just pornography. Pornography certainly is a big problem. And America is the number one exporter of that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when you think of Instagram, Instagram is really just selling envy. People go on there and they become very envious when they look at everybody else half the time it's not even their real life you know mm -hmm. they've doctored it up to make it look better than it is uh twitter twitter is selling anger people are very angry on twitter and then uh facebook is just selling you you know you're just a commodity for them so <clears throat> you look at all these things also very bad now just 50 years ago people knew what a sin was people knew what right and wrong was people still committed sins but they knew it was wrong Mm -hmm. Today, the culture has shifted so much that we're calling sin, you know, um, just living a good life. Mm -hmm. We're putting sin on a pedestal. We pay good money to go to the movie theaters and watch other people sin, and we have no problem with it, by and large, as a culture. That's different. That That's never been in the history of man, perhaps with the exception of maybe Sodom and Gomorrah mm -hmm. and various other parts of, of history, but now it's it's mainstream. Sin has become mainstream and nobody calls it a sin. That's except the rare few, you know, churches out there that are, are still holding um, fast to the Ten Commandments, which also have become very out of fashion for, for most people. Mm -hmm. So this is when you compound all these things together, it's creating a real cesspool of, of a culture. Mm. Yeah, and it's and I'm reading uh, I'm reading Charles Frone's uh, The Rise of Occultism, and he makes a point in the book that I thought was was very pertinent that uh, occultism has become so mainstream that we don't even recognize a lot of things as occultic anymore. Mm -hmm. um, right. and, and you know, honestly, I mean, you see pronouncements. You know, there's this like this big push, I would say, uh, in some circles in the church for like universalism. 
So this whole idea that everybody's saved, everybody's going to go to heaven, there's no hell, uh, ergo, there's no consequence for sin. Um, and then, you know, so maybe there's no sin, you know, or this idea that God's mercy, that you can't possibly withstand God's mercy. So you're de facto are going to go to heaven. Well, that that just flies in the face of, you know, of church teaching. And so uh, it's a it's a pernicious heresy because then it leads people to think, ah, well, I can just do whatever I want and I'm OK and there's no consequences. And, um, you know, so and I've been reading some of the exorcists, the books, you know, like Father Gabriel Mort and Monsignor Rossetti and, you know, and been kind of learning a little bit more about the the exorcism ministry and about how how hard it is, like when when you have attachments to to free yourself from those attachments and you know so can you tell us a little bit about that you know and like how real this is and, and i know you've you've done other interviews so i'm not going to ask you to just expound a lot on your exorcism ministry because i know you've done that elsewhere but you know i think it, it's worth kind of underlying again for people just how real evil su the supernatural evil is and and how it can attach yourself or attach to yourself can you tell us a little bit about that Yes. Well, one of the principles in this, the way things work with the divine order mm -hmm. is when sin abounds, God's grace superabounds. We know this, but you have to cooperate with it. You have to desire it. You have to want it. And with so many people, you know, the, the, there's many statistics lately that are saying the largest growing group of people in a church is the nuns, the, the ones who are leaving all religion altogether. They don't want any part of it. That's a big problem because then the the evil flourishes and we can see it. And then the fact that it seems to me that the media companies and the Hollywood people are all in collusion with pushing this, this sinful lifestyle upon uh, not just our country, but the whole world. So you have that going on. So what, what can man do? Live a life that you're loving God first and you love mankind as your, as your neighbor, as yourself. Mm -hmm. um, that's what Jesus told us to do. And what does that mean? It means if you love somebody, you want what's best for them. What's best for them is to get to heaven. And that's the thing we always have to keep on the horizon of every decision we make in life. Mm -hmm. Is this advancing mm -hmm. me towards heaven or is this moving me away from heaven, which is my goal. Mm -hmm. And this is why when people come out and say, we have to stand up for things like marriages between a man and a woman, you know, mm -hmm. um, it's not just naturally that that works through natural law, because that's the way we bring forth a new person. But it's also um, it's helping the person that doesn't want that to realize that there's moving away from the goal of heaven by persisting in a lifestyle that's contrary to that truth. Mm -hmm. Right. And when you say it to somebody like that, that what I want for you is to be with me in heaven at the end of this life, I'm, and I really want you to reconsider what you're doing here so that you can evaluate, is this really worth giving up eternity? Like, think about eternity. And that's a little bit more palatable to people in the moment when it comes from a heart of compassion, right? But if you just say you're going to hell... That, that doesn't win people over. They generally shut you down, mm -hmm. um, even though it could be true. But, but let's focus on the positive. We want to be in heaven together, and here's mm -hmm. the best way to do it. Mm -hmm. So now that you factor in the evil that's flourishing here, when sin is flourishing, that means the demons are given more power. And let me tell you something. In the last five years, I used to do an, the rite of exorcism, and it would be maybe one, possibly two, sessions and the person will be set free mm. and now it's taking you know like three four five times so i have to keep rescheduling people which is very cumbersome all, all the while while new cases are coming in and so it just gets to the point where it's becoming an overload right mm. i had to go to my diocese and ask for a second exorcist because i said it simply can't keep up uh chicago now has four uh, but that's such a big diocese i don't even know how they manage mm. um but but we've all noticed when the exorcists get together and talk, we've all realized something is happening where it appears that the, the demonic presence is 
having a stronger effect on people where it's more difficult to break them off. Now, what you opened this whole segment up about was the will, mm -hmm. you know, like where does the will come in and the, and the attachment? Well, if we're attached to certain things and unwilling to let go of them, we're kind of keeping an open door, right? So let's take it to an extreme case. If I'm a crack addict, but I don't want to give up the crack, mm -hmm. there's probably little chance you're going to ever become a healthy person. Mm -hmm. And and even that could be an, a doorway to a demon. I had one of my worst exorcist cases with somebody who went looking for drugs in the middle of the night and came upon a weird house that had pentagrams in it and upside down crosses. And that's where he bought the drugs. And this is a Catholic. And I said to him at one point, where were your spidey senses? They didn't, that did, wasn't a red flag, this pentagrams and upside down crosses. And he goes, I just wanted the drugs. And he said, as soon as I inhaled the smoke, I felt the demons go into me. Oh. So that's a case of like literally connected to the drug, right? Because they can do that. Uh, somebody who's dabbling in the occult can ask demons to attach to the drugs so that the person becomes instantly addicted and has to keep coming back for more and more and more. But you also get stuck with the demon. So the, your cleanest lifestyle and the sacramental graces of uh, going to church uh, and literally participating, not just attending, but drawing, being drawn in by the mystery and opening your heart to the graces so that when you leave mass, that in some way you've been transformed closer into the represent, representation of Jesus Christ than you were when you entered. That's somebody who's going to be very difficult to, to, to be messed with by a demon. Mm. Yeah. Well, and, it, you know, we, we are even, even faithful Catholics, you know, you still, you know, there, we live in a fallen world and it's very dark and it's getting darker, you know, so it's, you know, I think it's fair to say that even like faithful church going people will encounter dark spirits, you know, from time to time. And, you know, so it's like, uh, what I have learned, I guess, in my own life is like the, the only and sure way when I feel attacked is to, to remain humble and go in humility to our blessed mother and to Jesus. And, you know, just to like remind the demons, it's like, yeah, I, I can't do anything about y'all, but, but my mother and, you know, our Lord and savior, Jesus, they'll, they'll take care of you. You know? So it's always like going with a spirit of humility, right. And not being proud. Like, yeah, I'm a, I'm a faithful guy, you know, you can't, you can't get me, but let me ask you, um, so, you know, we, we are kind of seeing this uptick in, in, uh, in evil in the world. Are there any phenomena or like demonic personalities you're encountering more frequently these days? Like, um, I don't know, like mm. encounter Beelzebub a lot more than you used to, or as Modius or, you know, one of these demons or whatever, you know, are there, is there any kind of personalities that you're encountering more frequently and if so what does that tell you the answer is yes um currently i have a few cases i'm dealing with that's an incubus spirit mm -hmm. and this is one of the most repulsive because it actually sexually abuses people mm -hmm. uh, but you need to invite it in to some degree and and this is where people get tripped up uh so there was a woman who's a lawyer and she uh self-professed Gnostic, didn't care if there was a God, it, she wasn't interested in it. Mm -hmm. um, and she had something moving around in her bedroom at night. So she finally said to the thing, if you're, if there's something present here, grab my hand and something grabbed her hand. So for most people, that'd be like a sign to say, this is a problem. There's something in my room that I can't identify and who knows what else it's gonna do. But she didn't do that. She developed a conversation with this thing uh, asking for like yes and no answers through moving things in the room and whatnot. And eventually it progressed to, she felt, said it kissed her and she didn't swat it off and say, no, I, I don't want that. And, and eventually now it's having sex with her and then it's raping her. And now she doesn't like it. Mm -hmm. And that's when I get called to come in. But, you know, it's always this case. And I, and I had three at once of the same thing. Mm. It's always kind of strange. Cause you're like, well, why is this suddenly and popping up everywhere? Uh, and one of them was a man, you know, the, the spirits don't have gender, but they can Im impersonate gender. And he, he said to me in all honesty, you know, so I woke up 
half awake and didn't really know what was happening. But I felt like my genitals were being stimulated and he he was enjoying it. So he may, he had this thought, well, whatever this is, I, I like it. Mm -hmm. And th there was the permission. So if you're not schooled in this, like, think about it. If you're half day sleeping in and out, you're not really paying attention. It, it's easy to be tricked into giving the thing permission. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm seeing right now. Um, I, I'm not sure uh, why that happens, you know, to some degree. Um, I also think that people that are curious mm -hmm. are more at risk because they're more open to like just testing things and seeing what happens mm -hmm. or playing these games with, you know, whatnot, mm -hmm. um, Ouija boards and things like that, uh, because they don't believe it. And if you think this is all made up, of course, you're going to go into it thinking, how could I get hurt? It's not real. Yeah. Until they do get hurt. And then, you know, then you have to call somebody for help. Hmm. Well, you know, and I wouldn't be surprised that, you know, when you're you're telling us about the incubus spirits, I'm not entirely surprised given like how hypersexualized our culture is now. Like, uh, you know, like we're in a constant state as a culture of titillation, like of like low grade titillation, because like everywhere it's just sex and 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 whatnot and so um it's almost like we're in a, a perpetual state of like low-grade agitation you know so I, i'm not, i'm not surprised that you know and then of course with the proliferation of pornography and all this other stuff i'm not surprised that the demons are using that as a as a potential end um now you you mentioned this but um you know and i'd heard other exorcist like on YouTube and stuff, say this, but that they're finding exorcisms are 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 more difficult or taking longer these days. And so this question is, um, you know, is there less is there less grace being made available in the world due to an increase in man's cold-hearted rejection of God? You know, or is it? I mean, I know you know where evil abounds, grace abounds the more, but you know, maybe the answer is just that we're just, we're rejecting it. So we're not, you know, we're not seizing what the grace that's there, or is it that, that God is just, he's respecting our free will choice and said, okay, this is what you want. So I'm, I'm going to draw back and you're going to face the consequences of the choices you're making. I mean, kind of what do you see? What's, what's going on there? Well, there's our personal sin, which we have to take responsibility for. But then there's the corporate sin of, say, the whole country, right? Mm -hmm. And I think we're at a, an all-time high because of the, all the factors we just talked about in the last 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, when you go back to the scripture, it's always good to go back to the scripture, see what, what happened back in the scriptures and how did they deal with things like this? Well, remember what happened when they were just complaining miserably um, in the desert? and God said, I've had enough. And he sent the, the scorpion serpents to sting them. And they were dying. But when he sent these scorpions, you could imagine there would have been some, probably some Jews who weren't complaining, but they would also have to suffer with these serpents, right? Mm -hmm. um, when, when he sends a, a chastisement, it, it affects the good and the bad. You know, when a war breaks out, and we always think wars are, are the result of a chastisement from God, that even people who are very good and holy are suffering through the war. Mm -hmm. So I think that's kind of what we're in right now, that um, there's just a proliferation of sin. And the result is this pandemic of evil that's now draping over the whole nation, whether you're good or bad, you are you have to deal with it. Um, what did God do in the Old Testament? He sent a remedy to keep the people from dying. Notice he didn't take away the serpents. They were still getting stung, but now they could live. Mm. So there is period you have to endure for the transgression to be purged and uh you know it's kind of like once you walk through that 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 threshold that you've crossed the line now we do have to deal with it just like with a war once a war starts it's very unlikely it just ends the next day it's going to have to run its course until finally enough people hit their knees you know corporately the whole country right now if all of america let's say we had somebody who was very charismatic and had uh, the wherewithal to get on TV on every station at the same time and say, we need America right now 
to all bend your knees and ask God our Father for his mercy that we would be saved, our country, which is falling into peril. I think if that happened, he would rush in right away. But the problem is we have too many people now that would say, that's not my God. I don't believe in this. I'm not doing it. Mm -hmm. And the more people move away from God, the less are that group that can that can do that commitment to God. Mm -hmm. And which is why when it when the chastisement comes of whatever it may be uh, all through history, mm -hmm. most of those people get reconverted back to God have mercy. We can't take this anymore. Mm -hmm. Just like the Jews in the desert. Yeah. yeah. Like we, we have <laughs> time and time uh examples to history of, of what we need to do and yet we don't do it well and i i think right now we're we consensually or as a country corporately we're in love with being our own god right we want to be our own god we want to choose our own gender or mm -hmm. our identity or whatever um we don't want to create life yeah I on mean, our own without god yeah, like I saw a news report. I mean, and, and this isn't, I forget what it was. It was in like a scientific journal. So it wasn't just some kind of like wingnut thing, but it was like scientists, I think at like UC Berkeley or somewhere, it, people can look it up, but they were creating life. Um, like it was like artificial fetuses. Like, yes. I mean, completely devoid of like an egg and a sperm or something. I mean, you know, so it's like, that is a, a wholesale mockery or an affront mm -hmm. to God, uh, quite frankly. And, you know, there, I've got to assume there is supernatural consequences to that, that God will not just stand by. He's a patient and loving God, but he's not going to just stand by and just allow us to mock him and murder his children and abortion and do all these terrible things. I, there are consequences. Now, I had seen you had interviewed, I think, last year, Christine Watkins, and we're talking about the illumination of con uh, conscience. Um, can you tell us just a little bit about that? And like, do you feel like we are uh, we're getting closer to that maybe being a, a, a reality? Well, one would hope, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there's no certainty that this will happen. I mean, some of the saints have talked about it, and even Revelation has something that looks like it could be, you know, it's everything is written in a way it's hard to tell. Mm -hmm. But Faustina talked about something like this in her diary. And why would God do this for one generation and not another? That's what people most often come back to me and say. And I say, because I think we're living in one of the darkest times for humanity, mm -hmm. perhaps on the verge of the Antichrist, who knows? And if there's going to be a kind of evil perniciousness in the world that's never been here before, well, then God, in his own right, has he has the this, this sole right to, to then send a remedy, just mm -hmm. like to mounting the seraph on the pole. And this remedy could be that everybody gets to see in one moment where they're heading. Like, how great would that be? Mm -hmm. Hopefully people would know. But for all the people who have given up on God and said, I don't care if you exist, which to me seems even more arrogant than an atheist because it's it's a complete like i couldn't even care even if you exist it's just so rude mm -hmm. uh those sort of people will have a come to jesus moment where they realize oh wow i had no idea um i gotta rethink this and i think i do want to be on your side oh, but that'd be a great gift i mean imagine what could happen in one day the whole world could be the massive conversion of so many billions of people well, and I mean, it's, to that point of like, why one generation and not the other? Um, I mean, what we, about the flood? Yeah, I mean, but it's like you look at the you look at the state of the church today, and the the confusion and the the unclarity and the, um, I mean, you look at things like what's going on in Germany and some of the stuff being reported in the synod and synodality that they are um, weighing potentially embracing. I mean, it's like it feels like we need God to step in and say, no, no, hold on a minute. This is my church. And this is what we believe, right? We're not doing some like weird dog leg into paganism. You know, <laughs> it, this is how you properly relate to me, God, you know, and we don't make up our own things as we go along just to accommodate your 21st century lifestyle. So um, yeah, I would be a great mercy. I mean, and I think too, it's like, again, 
we have to lead with humility because it's like it's easy to think, oh, I'm I'm in pretty good standing with God. I go to church, so, you know, I'm I think I hold like the right views. And, you know, I, I know for myself, I would probably be shocked if I really knew like the, how uh, offensive my sins are to God and, and how much I offend him every day. So, well, let me ask you this. Um, what is your advice for people? you know, for protecting their loved ones who may find themselves spiritually oppressed, you know, given how dark our, our the landscape is in, like, you know, uh, and maybe some of this is like self, um, self-evident, but, I, you know, it's, you're dealing with the spiritual battle day to day, you know, and what are you seeing? Like, what are like, what are the tools people really should like hang on to and, and practices, devotions, whatnot? And it's like, yeah, you really want to, you really want to be praying the rosary every day. That's that is a non. Yes. Just, what what are some of your hundred your... percent? Well, if you can go to a mass every day, that would be best. Mm-hmm. Um, adoration every day, also excellent. You know, the sacraments have all the power, but it's the sacramentals that really tie people in emotionally. And what I mean by that is, we see people go to church every Sunday, mm-hmm. and they seem to leave the church and go right back into the world with very little change. But the people who are tied in with sacramentals, the rosary, mm-hmm. divine mercy chaplet, um, the precious blood with St. Bridget, pray- those prayers are so powerful. Those people become in love with Jesus. Mm-hmm. And it's just this great love affair they have where they so desire to be with him that that's, that's the highlight of their day is to go to mass. It's a completely different mindset from just somebody going on Sunday out of obligation. Mm-hmm. But remember, you know, um, these things have a great power for, and sacramentals rely on the belief in in the person who is uh, receiving the sacramental and the person giving it, Mm -hmm. just like an exorcism. So that's where holiness is very important. Um, So the more holy you are, the more you're devoutly loving God with all your heart, the more power these things will have, not only to transform you, but the people around you. But yes, rosary, mass, adoration, uh, absolutely 100%. At least if you can get every day, that'd be great. Now, if you have a job where you can't do it, fine. Uh, the uh, St. Bridget uh, prayers with the seven uh, ways Jesus lost blood, very powerful. Very Because this is all about, really, it's about him offering his himself to the Father mm-hmm. uh, all through all these experiences. And the devil hates it. And then the chaplet of St. Michael, if you're invoking the nine choirs of the good angels, mm-hmm. we're in a battle against the bad angels. No one has a better vision of this after God than the angels that are fighting their very former, you know, comrades that, that were booted out of heaven. So I, I find that when I'm, I pray that every day, you know, and I ask every one of those choirs and they each have a particular assistance. You know, if you look at the way the prayers are set up. Mm-hmm. So if you're struggling with sins of lust, well, then there's this particular choir that could be uh, helping you that day. And each one of them has, but most of them are dealing with you know, overcoming all the evil. Mm-hmm. So those are the things I would do. Psalm 91 is uh, actually in the rite of exorcism. That's a very powerful prayer protection, mm-hmm. as is the um, prologue of St. John, which we know was part of the extraordinary form mass. Uh, that's also in the rite. So all of those things, you know, yeah. really combination. But really, it's your holiness that they hate. Mm. Mm. And this is kind of the weird way that evil works because people who are really evil, um, they're not going to mess with them because they've already got them in their pocket. Mm-hmm. So for the most part, those demons aren't harassing those people. They want them to continue doing what they're doing. Mm-hmm. Then you have the the vast, it's like the bell curve. Then you have the big section in the middle. It's most people that are, they're trying to grow in virtue, but it's it's an uphill battle. It's very difficult. Yeah. Um, and as they make progress, they will find there'll be some retaliation trying to push them back. Mm-hmm. And then you get over the curve to the radical holy people that were the saints, the living saints, mm-hmm. where their soul is basically untouchable now. They've become so enraptured with god they're almost in this union with god that there's no way the devil can do anything about that so all they can do is physically beat them Mm. so this is the other end of the spectrum where you're going to find very holy people getting tormented like john vianney and uh padre pio and saint anthony of the uh, desert yeah exactly but these people knew the power of the cross 
Yeah. And they knew I will just take my sufferings and unite them to your cross, Lord, and now go save another thousand people from going to hell. And and they would always win. Yeah. Uh, when people uh, hear that, they go, oh, I don't know if I want to be that holy. I go, don't worry. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's when you get there, you're not worried about the devil. Well, and you're not worried about yourself. Right. Yeah. It's like, like, right. When we're on this part of the curve, we're all like, oh, that sounds really hard. I don't know if I can do that. By the time you get over here, yeah, God willing, we get over here. You're so in love with God that you're not even thinking about like your own discomfort. It's like a discomfort is something I can offer up to our Lord, you know, and it's a consolation. There's a joy in it. It's like St. Paul. Yeah. Yeah. Just boasting. Yeah. Yeah. yeah for sure. Well, Father Rahel, thank you so much for sharing your insights. And of course, thank you for your priesthood and, you know, especially for your, your ministry too, as a, an exorcist, you know, I'm sure it's got to be a lot of work uh, in this day and age and, you know, but it's got to be very satisfying too, to, you know, when, when you help free someone, when you cooperate with God to help liberate someone from, from evil. So Thank you so much for that. And uh, would you be uh, so kind as to uh, say a prayer for us and for our listeners as we close out? Absolutely. So Heavenly Father, we come before you. We ask you to pour out your spirit upon this audience that's listening to this broadcast now and in the future, if it's ever repeated, that they'd be given such great graces of fortitude for great holy courage in this day and age we live in for um a holy fear of the Lord that they would they would have such a fear of displeasing you and and in any way offending you that they'd be given great graces of joy and peace that would emanate out to the whole world, drawing many 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 more people back to you, our Lord. And I bless you all in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Paul. Thank you.